The main text is right there, proof of love, and it's from Romans chapter 5, verse 8, and I'll share that again as we go. But, as always, a little bit of prayer before we go into reading God's Word. I like to call it an eyes-open prayer. And so, Lord, we come before you, and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would be opening our eyes to see the wonderful things that are here in your Word, and to know that you are ministering in each one of our hearts in exactly the way that we need. The depth of your Word, that it is living and active, and that you speak to us right where we are at, right in the areas that we need to be ministered to the most, the challenges that we need to be given, the encouragements that we need to have work in our hearts. You know all things. You know our hearts. So we are dependent on you to open our eyes to the truths that we're going to be reading today. And we ask that in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Last night... During our worship service, the live stream service, we finished the 8th chapter of Romans. That was both exciting and saddening to me, as I mentioned, because it's my favorite chapter in the book of Romans. So to think about closing that chapter was like, no, I even, I even mentioned to the, the crew here last night, I said, maybe we should just go back through another nine <laughs> weeks of, of Romans chapter 8. But... I am excited for what is ahead, too. There are more chapters in Romans to just continue to be revealing these great truths of God. Well, as we closed out chapter 8 last night, uh, we looked at the final two questions. Paul began posing questions in chapter 8, verse 31, and it carried all the way through to last night. And the two questions, and really the answer, that was, was listed there is this. What or who can separate us from Christ? The answer is nothing at all. Isn't that great? Nothing at all can separate us from God's love, from the love of Christ to us. Absolutely nothing. And I love it because Paul dealt with all of that right in the first verse of our main text last night. Verse 35 tells us that. And yet... He spent the remaining verses all the way to verse 39 exposing and revealing even more how much, how complete that, that nothing at all is. And at the end of verse 35, I just I want to share this part with you. He says, Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, shall any of those separate us from Christ? The answer is, not at all. So there is no struggle in life that has the power or the ability to strip away Jesus' love from us. How amazing that is. But see, Paul didn't stop there either. I believe the Lord was so passionate about seeing to it that we would understand the, the fullness of this, that there was more. By the last two verses... Paul tells us, I'm just going to kind of give the list. He tells us that nothing in life can separate us from Jesus. And death also has no power to remove Jesus' love from us. There is no spiritual being, whether good or bad, the holy angels or the fallen angels, who are able to remove Christ's love from us. Nothing in your life right now, nothing today has the ability to remove Jesus' love. And it's the same for tomorrow and your entire future forward. None of those are able to, to diminish Jesus' love for you. There's no earthly ruler who has the power to take away Jesus' love from us. There is no obstacle, high or low, that will hinder Jesus' love from you and I. And then Paul ended in verse 29. He says, he says it this way. And nothing else in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. He, he said, hey, just in case there's anything missing, I'm just going to do this 
this large sweep of saying nothing in all of creation. And we're not talking about just earth. We're talking about the universe. We're talking about every possible thing, what is visible and invisible. None of it can remove the love of Christ from us. Isn't that amazing? That great assurance that we have. Well, today in our deeper devotional, we're going to be looking at the proof of that love. And we're going to do that, uh, we're actually going to back up in the book of Romans, we're going to go back to chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 8, because here it gives us proof, it actually gives us tangible proof of this love that we have in Jesus that we cannot be separated from. Here it is, this is what Romans 5 verse 8 tells us, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The tangible proof of God's love is the cross. It is what Jesus accomplished on the cross. And He did it while we were still yet sinners. He did it while we were enemies. We were in opposition to Him. Jesus wasn't dying for friends. Jesus wasn't dying for people who were applauding and thanking and saying, this is great. Jesus died on the cross with people spitting in his face and making insults. Jesus died on the cross for sinners. Talk about love. A love that has no bounds. A love that goes beyond just those who would love back. It's amazing what Jesus did at the cross and to think that that is tangible proof. Because see, that word demonstrates in, in verse 8 is so important. But God demonstrates His own love. Listen, God tells us all over the place, all throughout this book, that He loves us. He, he tells us, and it's important for us to hear that. But it's also important for us to be able to see that, to have it demonstrated for us. To illustrate this just a little bit further, some of you have heard the story, but you know what? Cotton's going to appreciate this because it involves bikes, and he and I have this bike thing going on. So, so uh, going way back now, when I lived in Napa, every practically every night I would drive up to the Second Street garage because it was all lit up, and, and I would practice my bike tricks up there at the top. And I knew it wasn't the safest place to be. There's a lot of bad activity that could happen up there. So I always had my truck pointed at the exit so that if I heard the screeching of wheels, all I'd have to do is throw my bike in the back, jump in the cab, and speed out of there. Well, one night, it's a Friday night, it's pretty late, probably 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, and I'm out there practicing my tricks, and all of a sudden, what do I hear but the screeching of wheels coming up? So, I know my drill, the bike goes in the back of the truck, I'm getting into the cab, when a cop car comes swinging around that corner, both doors opening up, and over their intercom they say, come out with your hands up. And I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> you know, so I get out of the truck, my hands are up, and, and they said, what are you doing here? Instantly I realized how foolish this was going to sound, but I said, I'm riding my bike, <laughs> yet I'm sitting in my truck. I don't know how to explain this. And they said, you are riding your bike here on a Friday night. Why aren't you out partying with your friends? I said, well, that's not what I do. I come and I, I practice bike tricks. They said, well, we're going to need to search you. So they did a full body search. Then they went into my truck. And I felt so bad about this because I, I, was, I was messy back then. I had like Burger King... Uh, fast food takeout bags filled with like half-eaten hamburgers and stuff all and they had to go through every square inch of that also that they could not find any drugs or weapons or anything <laughs> right so they get through that search and then they said okay really you you you're riding your bike here and i said yeah they said show us Oh, oh boy, okay. So I felt instantly like I was in one of those old westerns where they've got the guns pointed, and it's like, dance, boy, you know, so I'm on the bike, and I'm trying to do my tricks, and I'm messing up horribly, but they didn't care. They, they're applauding, and they're excited, and, and when I was finished, they said, hey, listen, technically, you're not supposed to be up here. This is not a good place. But tonight, take your time leaving if you know what we mean. And they took off. 
they gave me the permission to stay there. I didn't stay very long. That was enough excitement for the night. But I share this story with you because those cops needed proof. And what was going to prove my real uh, happening up there, what I was actually doing, was to give them a demonstration so that they could see it with their own eyes, so that they would know, okay, that truly is what this weird guy is doing up here. Listen, the fact that God demonstrates that he shows that he gives this tangible proof about his love is an amazing thing. He doesn't have to. He's God. He doesn't have to do that, and yet he has. And here's the great thing. When we look at this in Scripture, we say, okay, so, so Jason, you're saying this is tangible truth, but we're reading it from the Bible, which is all about God and Jesus, so of course it's going to talk about that's tangible proof. Understand this. There are extra biblical sources, sources outside of Scripture itself, that speak in to this very same thing, that speak to this tangible proof of Jesus' love, of God's love through the cross. We can read in, in historical documents that the cross of Christ actually happened. Flavius Josephus. Um, fun name, but he, he, he was a, a historian, a Jewish historian. He has a historical work called Antiqu Antiquities, that's a hard word for me to say, Antiquities of the Jews. He wrote it back in 93 or 94 AD. I want to read this to you. It not only speaks to the death of Jesus on the cross, but the resurrection as well. I mean, I figured if we wouldn't go to the cross, why stop there? So look at this. He writes, Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, it would be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross. This is not the Bible, y'all. When he had condemned him to the cross, those who loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct at this day. Amen. We get to be proof of that. Listen, Josephus, as best we know, never placed faith in Jesus. He, he was Jewish, but he never placed faith in Jesus as Messiah. So for him to write that kind of information in his historical document, we have to understand he, he wasn't... He wasn't being biased. He wasn't just saying, oh, well, I'm going to put this in because it's my agenda for people to know this. He was strictly writing what was historically true. So we have in this great demonstration of the cross, this great demonstration of, of God's love for us, we, we're able to take that tangible proof and say, it's not just written in the Bible, which would be good enough. Because even this is historical. But we can go places outside of the Bible and see that they all point to that demonstration of God's love. That Jesus indeed, he in fact died on that cross. And what a demonstration of love. So, I share that with us today, because as we talked last night about, about this idea of that love of Christ, never never being separated from us. You know, sometimes, even though we know it is not and it won't be, we, we feel in the moment like maybe he doesn't love me anymore. Maybe it's true for everyone else and not me. You ever been there before? Listen, when you reach those times, when you come to that place, that day or that season in your life, Look back to the cross. Look back to this great demonstration of God's love that will never fade, that will never go away, that cannot ultimately be argued, and be reminded, okay, there's the proof. 
There's the proof of God's love that I need today, that I need in this particular season. And maybe it's not even just for those days or those special seasons, but for every day that we can wake up and we can say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your great love that you have tangibly proved to me through the cross. Amen? Amen. 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 So we get to take that great assurance that we read about at the end of Romans 8 last night, and we get to bring this tangible proof into, into that so that we can walk in this assurance, so we can walk each day knowing that Jesus Christ, the Creator, the Savior, the Redeemer, loves you. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you for the assurance. We thank you for the proof. We thank you for the cross. Because without the proof of your love, we would never be able to, to truly recognize and, and know your love. Thank you that you have loved the world enough, God, so much that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus. Your one and only Son to die on the cross. So that any who believe will not perish but have everlasting life through you. Lord, my, my prayer is for the church that we would, we would cling to this truth, this assurance. That we would daily be more and more aware of your love. That will never be separated from us. No circumstance, no thing, no one can take it away. And Lord, I pray also for those who have not trusted you in your work, Jesus, through the cross. I, I pray for those that they would be awakened to your great love. That they would experience something like never before. The God of the universe, the eternal one, having love for them, specifically, individually. Lord, may you awaken that love. And I pray this all in your name, Jesus. And Lord, I attach to that. We hear sirens going down the highway right now. We don't know the situation. You do. We trust you with it, Lord. We ask that you would use this, even, as an opportunity to draw those who are in trouble into your loving kindness that you would make your love known to them today. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.